Hi, I'm Dave. And I'm Paul. And we're going to challenge you to transform your financial future through the principles of the most profitable business in the world, banking. We believe everyone should be involved in two businesses, the business that you're in and the banking business. Everyday people can replicate what bankers have been doing for centuries to leverage capital and build wealth through private lending. Join us as we uncover the truths about money, expose lies and myths, and flip conventional financial advice on its head. Here we go. Hey, what's up, Dave? Paul, good afternoon. How you doing? I'm doing good. Doing good. Had a had a fairly productive morning. I slept in a little bit past my normal uh, early wake up time. What time do you wake up? Tammy's. If Tammy hears this, she's gonna say I'm a liar. But um, <laughs> generally between five and six. Okay. Yeah, I'm about the same. I like to get my seven to eight hours of sleep. Uh, I got spoiled being a pilot where you were given 12 hours off in between duty periods, right? So uh, right. I definitely took advantage of that eight hours. So I, uh, my body likes Bottle, that. 12 but, hours. Yep. The crew rest. Bottled the throttle, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Don't have that rule anymore. Yeah. Well, hey, right. thanks for starting later. I know we plan to do this earlier in the day. I was doing, uh, took my son to a private school to do an assessment that we're trying to get him into to start next semester. So, um, had a flex and, and go do that for him. So starting that next year, putting all the kids in, in private school. So it's going to be a, a big expense. And I'm thinking about opening up another uh, policy to run that money through before I give it to the school. So capture that somewhere else first. Yeah, I love that. So I've already done it before with you know, with charitable givings. Uh, I've got a charitable giving policy. Now I'm thinking about, hey, I need a private school tuition policy so that money doesn't leave my hands forever. No, I think, you know, it's similar to what Tammy and I did. We When we moved here to Northern Virginia, we we chose private school and, and went that route. And it's been wonderful. Um, I feel like it's the best school that they've been in thus far. So, um, yeah, great move. And, yeah, definitely capture that tuition before it leaves your before it leaves your banking system, exactly. it goes to somebody else's. So great idea. Well, that's the whole point. That's the whole point of what we're talking about. So infinite banking. So this is episode number two, uh, recording at the very end of 2021, uh, just two days left in the year here. Um, so I figured today, um, why don't we just talk about infinite banking from a, you know, maybe a not quite a 30,000 foot view, maybe a 15,000 foot view, get into it a little bit um, for people new to it. And then people who have been around it or who understand it or are even using it uh, should get something from this too. you know, help them help with their understanding of the whole process. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Why don't you go? Why don't you go? What is a infinite banking concept? The infinite banking concept. We'll just call it IBC. I don't like to put the the in front of the IBC. I think it sounds kind of dumb. I know people, some people do that. The IBC. Just say IBC. The IBC. Yeah, it sounds... <laughs> Yeah, I'm just going to go with IBC. Yeah. Yeah, so the infinite banking concept, uh, we'll refer to it as IBC, discovered by Nelson Nash. Um, you know, like you said the other day on our podcast, the, you know, the godfather of infinite banking. Um, so, you know, on the interwebs, there's a lot of confusion out there about what it is and a lot of people opining about it, uh, but it's quite simple. It's a process. Uh, the idea of banking... Uh, Banking is a process, the movement of money, movement of capital. Um, and what Nash was trying to get at, and we highly recommend that you read his book, was um, that you that you finance everything you buy, right? Either, you either pay cash or you use a, a, a third-party lender, like a bank or a finance company. So you so, have to decide. No, explain that. So I think everybody understands... When you borrow money, you finance it because you're paying interest to somebody. But why? How can you say that you're financing it when you pay cash? Yes. So I had this conversation back in, uh, I don't know, it was in November, October, with my father-in-law, who I discovered has been doing IBC their entire life, just not with dividend-paying whole life. But that's mm -hmm. a separate story. But we had this conversation. He said, "Well, if I if I pay cash for, you know, the '69 Camaro, then I don't have a I don't have a car payment." I was like, that's true, but you also don't have that money anymore. And the opportunity cost on that money that is no longer yours, what is that opportunity cost? Is it 5% per year? Is it 10% per year? You know, whatever. It's unknown, but it's there's an opportunity cost to that money. Right. So I think people 
they they forget that there's a there's a cost of capital. There's a cost of money, regardless if you pay cash or you finance it. Does does that make sense? Yeah. So now what you're saying, you hand cash over in exchange for a car. Now you have the car, but you don't have your cash. And what does it mean when you don't have your cash? It means you can no longer earn interest on that cash for the rest of your life. It's gone forever, right? Instead of retaining that cash and earning uninterrupted compound interest on that cash up until the day you die, at the end of the day, you would have your cash, your original cash, and you would have your car if you if you combine those methods. So actually speaking yeah, of cars, so that's, that's a good one. I always like to ask people <clears throat> when when I introduce this to people, I say, and I'll just treat you like, uh, hey, you and I just met, Paul. You asked me, uh, you know, we start talking about this whole infinite banking thing and 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 you're in, you're intrigued. So I say, well, hey, Paul, um, you and I have been taught to buy a car one of two ways. What are the two ways you, you, you've you been taught to buy a car? Go ahead. You answer. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say I could pay cash or I could finance it through, you know, Chrysler Financial or whatever. Exactly. Right. So you think there's two ways you pay cash or you borrow cash. Well, what the infinite banking concept does is we combine those. We bring both of those concepts together and control the entire equation. So let's talk about how that's done. So what does that even mean? How, how could you combine saving, being a saver and a debtor and become a wealth creator, which to me is the third type of person. You got the saver, the debtor, the wealth creator, the saver does what, you know, over three, five years, they save up money, $30,000 to go buy that car. And then they hand over that cash to get that car. And now they're back at the zero line. Right. And then the debtor right. does exactly the opposite. They go into debt, $30,000 on day one. They don't have the patience or the discipline to save for five years. So they go into debt and then spend the next five years climbing out of that debt and getting back to zero. So at the end of the day, what's the difference between the saver and the debtor? Like they're both at zero. Nothing. They, yep. They're on the perpetual zero line. Um, I think I do think the saver has a lot more potential and, and, and is likely a little bit better off just because of their behavior. But generally speaking, they're in the same spot. Yeah, exactly. That behavior being disciplined and, and um, putting off. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, they can delay gratification. Delay gratification. Yeah. Right. And so. And- I would agree. They'd be in a better position, but at the end of the day, they're still both back at zero with a depreciating as uh, liability. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. So while we're on this car subject, I want, I wanted to, uh, you recently got a new truck. I've, I've ridden in it real nice Ram 1500. Mm-hmm. And, um, you financed that, that acquisition in a, in a, in a neat way. I did. I did. And this, you know, we should probably make this an entire episode in the future, but yeah, I financed it. Um, and I did it in a way that I utilized my cash value. So, which is a great way to, to go buy a car, right? You save up your cash inside your policy. You take a loan against the cash value that you've saved up and you go buy that car with, with cash essentially, right? You're just using the insurance company's cash to buy it. Um, then I have a car free and clear, and then I just make those loan payments back to the insurance company on my own repayment schedule. I just took it one step farther and took a loan against my cash value, put it into another asset that generated enough monthly cash flow to pay me enough to cover my truck payment, which I finance over 84 months. So I got the longest financing possible, uh, which... Yeah, it costs a little more interest. I don't care because what I did is I created an asset that created enough monthly cash flow to cover that. So it's a net zero impact on my on my lifestyle. I don't have to worry about the payment. It's coming every that. month. Yeah. So. Yep. That's very, yeah. very Kiyosaki of you, you know, buy an asset that, that'll help your life, you know, create lifestyle for you. Exactly. So Not every asset has to be you a cash flowing real estate property, right? Those are those are a little tougher to come by sometimes, which I, I love them. But there's other assets that will also provide cash flow. 
Absolutely. So you mentioned the debtor, the saver, and the wealth creator. Let's get into that. Let's get into that wealth creator, you know, IBC. How does the wealth creator use whole life insurance? How does it, can you explain to me like, like I'm a five-year-old child, maybe, maybe, maybe an eight-year-old or an eighth grader. I don't know. Okay. In a simple way, how does that wealth creator do that? Like he's not on the perpetual zero line every few years when he buys something he is, or she is on a constant kind of, you guys can picture a line just constantly going up at a nice steady pace. Can you, uh, let's talk about that. Okay. Well, let's first start with the assumption that the saver it, or the debtor are used to making monthly payments every single month perpetually, right? Because as soon as that sure. debtor pays off that car, it's probably time for a new car. They're going to sell it, go get another loan and start back, you know, with the negative and work their way back up again. And the saver, they're used to saving. They got that discipline, saving, say, $500 every single month. Uh, even after they buy that new car, they're saving up 500 for the next new car, right? So we got to assume that they're making consistent payments somewhere, for the saver, they're making those consistent payments into their bank account. To for the debtor, they're making consistent payments to the to the bank in the form of you know, repaying a, a, a finance loan. So, the wealth creator though will make those same payments into a properly structured dividend paying whole life policy um, or an IBC policy. When we say that, that's what we're referring to. They'll make those consistent payments in there until they have enough cash value built up. And instead of taking that cash out of the policy, they don't want to do that. They don't want to interrupt the compounding going on in there, right? So the whole idea is never take that cash out. It's locked in there earning interest and dividends for you for the rest of your life. Now, instead of taking your cash, you're just going to go to the insurance company. You're first in line to take a loan from their pot of money. They're going to give you the $30,000, you know, assuming you have that much in your cash value to take out to go buy that car. And now your consistent monthly payments, you're just simply making that monthly payment back to refill your loan that you took. And guess what? Every dollar you pay back in a loan in that outstanding loan balance becomes a dollar that you can borrow again right away. So at the end of the day, you paid that loan back. You got that off the plate, but your cash value inside has continued to compound on the entire amount as if you never took a loan out. And that's the power of it. So that's that's where that trajectory just keeps going straight up and never up, down, up, down. So did, did that make sense to an eight year old? I, I think, yeah, I think my nine and 11 year old would have understood that uh, for sure, for sure. Very simple. Um, you know, I think there's, again, people try to overcomplicate this process, but once you, once you dig into it, just a tiny bit, just to scratch the surface, it's quite, it's quite simple. And I think, yeah, I think you explained it perfectly. Yeah. Now let me flip the tables on you as, um, you know, most people listening are probably, I'm going to guess, you know, 30 to 50 years old. Uh, we probably got some on the younger side, some on the older side and guess what? Infinite banking works for all ages. You know, maybe if you're you know beyond seventy, I don't I don't know, but you could it could work on a different person who's insured. Probably don't want to insure yourself if you're seventy five years old, but you have grandkids. Um, so anyway, I I digress. Let me flip the pages because most people I think who are listening understand what a mortgage is. So another way that you and I really like to compare this is that it, it's kind of like a mortgage. So why don't you explain it from the mortgage um, example? Yeah, absolutely. I just try to throw my mouse across the room. So, okay. Don't get mad. So, what we're going to talk about here, people, very everyone's everyone's very familiar with how a mortgage works, um, and what we're trying to gonna what we're going to tell you here is that life ins paying life insurance premium into a properly structured dividend paying whole life or IBC type policy works very similarly. So like you make mortgage payments, that builds equity in the home, right? Likewise, when I make my annual premium payments, and I pay annually, 
life insurance is very flexible. You can pay monthly, annually, quarterly, semi-annually. Um, I pay annually because it's the most efficient way. So when I make my my premium payments, part I have this contractual uh, cash value growth, the equity in the policy, which is guaranteed every year to increase. I can't do anything about it. It's going to go up. Every premium payment I make, the cash value increases or the equity position, my equity position in those policies increases. And can that equity ever the, be removed, I mean, or uh, decreased contractually? Never. Right. Nope. It will, it will never decrease in value now. And I know what you're getting at. You know, we've, we've seen some people certainly in the 2008 area. Um, I know in some parts of the country were hit harder than others, but a lot of people lost, you know, their home, their home values plunged because frankly, the home values were, <laughs> were way inflated, right. but it doesn't matter, right? They still lost, you know, my, in fact, my dad's, one of my dad's best friends was, was literally upside down. And, you know, the only thing he can do is, hey, just continue to make that payment because eventually, you know, eventually or hopefully it'll it'll recover and he'll be in a better position. But um, but, you know, great point. It is guaranteed to never decrease. My equity in my policy attained in year one or year 10 or year 20 is guaranteed to never decrease. So there are not many asset classes out there that offer guarantees like this and certainly whole life insurance, particularly IBC style dividend paying whole life is is, is one of those. Okay. So you, you, you make a mortgage payment every month. How long until you actually build up enough equity that you could borrow? And then what's that process look like out you know, to borrow the equity in a home? Sure. I've done that uh, a couple of times on, on a couple of different homes. So I guess it, the answer, the, the quick answer is it depends, but let's just assume, um, that the house is increasing in value. So I'm building equity there. It's going up by a couple of percentage points every year. Of course, folks listening to this in late 2021 are going to say, well, my house increased by 20% in yeah, the last year or 30, you know, whatever, yeah. which is a, which, which is atypical, right? It's right. atypical. I and mean, we could have a different discussion about why that is occurring, but let's just say on average, I build, you know, I've got a million dollar home just for round numbers. I, put my 20% down. And then over, over the years, I build up another 10 or 20% equity. Well, the bank will look, I can go to the bank and say, Hey, listen, I've got $300,000 worth of equity. I'd like to, I'd like to tap into some of that equity. And you go through a mortgage process, just like you did when you bought the house, you, you know, bring your tax returns, your bank statements, your rental property, stuff, you know, all this, and people know what I'm talking about. The more assets you have, the more stuff you have to show, Mm -hmm. um, which is, which can be a very frustrating process and a lot of your time and energy going into it. And then maybe, um, in my case, I was approved. We were approved for a couple, couple of home equity lines of credit and we got them. And, but I, but I, but I tell you what, it's, there are some people that don't get approved for HELOCs or home equity loans, right? For and whatever reason. it has reason, nothing to do bank, with how much equity you have in your home. You could have $100,000 of equity and still be denied, right? I think in 2020, uh, it was proven, you know, a, a global uh, pandem- pandemic, um, you know, forced banks. It didn't force banks. Banks made the decision themselves or maybe the Fed told them to, but they cut off HELOCs. Like some people... Uh, some Absolutely. banks just straight up said no more HELOCs. We don't care who you are, how much equity you have. Sorry, you cannot access any of that money. Uh, all the while, that, that's when people really needed it. I, I tell you, the idea of control, controlling, controlling your own, you know, the banking function in your life. Um, you know that that hurt a lot of people, I'm sure, and that that begs the question. You know, and again, this is going to be another some we're going to we're going to repeat ourselves a lot in this podcast, probably. But where is the best place for home equity to reside? And if, if 2020 taught us anything, if 2008 taught us anything, it's not in the home. Right. So all these folks, Dave, and the, and the one of the points I want to make, and I don't want to get too off topic here, but people that pay extra on their mortgage every month or refinance into a 15 year mortgage, giving the bank 
their money back faster than they than they're asking you to do is is not a, a good strategy. And that might hurt. That's going to hurt some people's feelings. But it's the truth. Yeah, what are your, what are your I mean, What's your take? Yeah. Who convinced us that paying giving more of our money to the bank faster than they ask for it was a good idea? Um, I think I think that happens when people look through their financial decisions with a through a single lens. Uh, in this case, it's, oh, how, <clears throat> excuse me, how much money am I going to pay in interest on a 30 year mortgage? Well, a lot more than a 15 year. OK, but you got to look at everything else. And we'll definitely do an, a, a, an episode that's all about the 15 versus the 30 year mortgage, because mathematically, I'll tell you right right now, there's there's zero advantage mathematically of doing a 15 year mortgage uh, and the math. Well, it, it's in the numbers. It's proven. So there's zero financial advantage. Emotional advantage, perhaps, if you need that. Uh, for some people, it is. Um, but financially, zero. Uh, and we'll prove that some other time. But so to kind of wrap that whole example, you make that monthly mortgage payment. It builds up equity. If you're lucky and you ask really nice with sugar on top, the bank will loan you that your money that's inside your house Um and they'll put they're they're going to put some restrictions on it, terms on it, right? It's not going to be indefinite. You got to pay it back in a certain time. Uh, you got to pay yep. it back uh, maybe monthly. It's got to be all paid off after ten years. It's flexible. Maybe the interest rate can go up and down. So I'd say our our method <clears throat> or the the method of using an infinite banking versus uh, a mortgage or building that home equity and utilizing HELOC. IBC has some distinct advantages. Uh, I'd say, you know, three big ones right off the bat are that you own and control your, your IBC policy. Um, and the HELOC, the bank owns it. They control it. Uh, in IBC, your, your equity is guaranteed to increase. And as you mentioned, your home's equity and even your home's value is definitely not guaranteed to increase. So will it? Yeah, sure. Over the long run, absolutely. But are there going to be times when it takes a dip and maybe you're underwater? It's happened. Um, and then finally, there's no required repayments with this method, with the IBC method. So you can set up those monthly repayment plans uh, as you see fit. Maybe one month you can't make the payment because you lost your job. So you can't repay that loan. So what? The insurance company doesn't care. Uh, it doesn't affect your credit. Nobody's going to come uh, foreclose on your house or take your car away because you couldn't make that payment back to the insurance company on your loan, right? They're going to get their money when you die someday from your death benefit if you owe them anything. So it's guaranteed. So it doesn't matter. Now, should you make that loan payment? Of course, you should never just, well, there are times when maybe you don't want to repay loans and that's in retirement or passive income years, as Nelson calls it. Um, but uh, it doesn't matter. There's no required repayment schedule. So I love that example. Yeah, that that's huge. You know, you, everything you mentioned just comes back to just comes back to that word control. The control over the banking function is super critical. And you know, I'm we're on some of these these Facebook groups where at least fifty percent of the questions are about lending, or about HELOCs, or about you know, all, you know, it's, it's about banking, right? right? It's about the banking function and it's clear what I, you know, I read these posts and you know, some young people on there, some people our age, you know, where Dave and I are 42 and there's people that are severely undercapitalized who have to go, you know, and I think, you know, James Nethery says this, you know, go with their hat in their hand to the bank in order to do what they want. Right. Um, and it's, it's not a, you know, you want to go into a bank with, from a position of strength, I think, and not a position of weakness. And that's yeah. what, that's what I incorporating IBC into your life can really do for you. Because guess who banks don't like to lend money to? They don't like to lend money to people who need it. They only like lending money to people who don't need it. It's, it's just a fact. <laughs> that's right. Um, and that, that was proven. I mean, you and I are playing the bank right now with, uh, somebody who was referred to us because, uh, this person in our network knew that we were well capitalized and our network was well capitalized. 
and we've done private loans to private entities in the past. And that person could not get a loan from a bank for what they wanted to do. So they came to us. And, and what did we do? I mean, all the different steps we took to ensure that our capital is going to be returned to us, um, no matter what happens. Of course, there's, there's a little risk, uh, but we mitigated nearly everything you could think of, right? And eliminated some risk and mitigated the rest, uh, just like a bank does. So that's, that's what we do now. We play banker. It's a good business. Absolutely. It's a, it's a great banking is the, is the most profitable business in the world, I believe. Um, yep. it is, it's been wonderful. I actually was speaking to that individual earlier before we get on this, uh, on this recording, but, um, you know, someone who has just real quick has, has read Nelson's book, has read a couple other books about infinite banking and someone who has a high income W2, very, you know, no debt and the bank still said no. Yep. We're not going to loan you this money for this for this business venture. Right. And he's crushing it. <laughs> yeah, he's crushing it. The bank yeah, should have. Um, they didn't. May, and maybe it didn't fit the uh, the portfolio of deals that they were looking for at the time because the bank stacks deals. They turn around, they sell those. They sell that paper to another bank or they leverage it with the Fed and get more money. Um, and maybe it didn't fit what they were looking for. So now you got, you know, maybe there is a bank out there that it would fit. But how are you going to find it? Like if, if he had been yep. doing this 10 years ago, what we're doing, he would have been so well capitalized. He could have, he could have bought everything he needed for that business. And, uh, I, I think we'll probably have him on, on the show sometime in the future, right? Cause his business is crushing it and we're, we're happy and proud to be a part of it and be able to, to play banker and, and make good money on our end while he's making great money on his end. So it's a truly a win-win. Absolutely. And he's, and he's so thankful and, and, and happy and, and just, uh, so yeah, we're going to help him, uh, help him with his IBC journey now so that he can become his own banker and not have to be a, you know, why would we do that? Why would we do that? Paul, we're we're making really good money right now. Like he's paying us a lot of interest to borrow our (laughs) money. So why do we want (laughs) to, we're kidding. We're kidding. Cause that's what he should do. So that's what we're teaching him to do. You specifically telling him, Hey, you could keep paying us this high interest rate, um, or you could start putting your money over here and create your own banking system and do it on your own. And that's what he's going to do. So yeah, are we, we're working ourselves out of a really solid investment. Yeah. But he's going to be much better off for it. And, and there's other opportunities that are going to come along for us because that's what happens, right? When you have capital opportunities are attracted to capital. Yep. That is, we could do a whole episode on that. It's, it's been, and we talked about it in the first episode a little bit, I think is it's just, it's so true, but Dave, people aren't going to, unless you're well capitalized and into this space, you're just not going to see it. Right. You, you know, you're not going to be looking for the opportunity. You're not going to see it. Um, you're not going to know that it exists. Um, but I'm telling you folks, there's a, where there's a will, there's a way, and there's just a better way to, you know, to live this American life and plan for, you know, the passive income days, not retirement. We don't use that word. No passive income. It's a communist term. So yeah, good. Well, I think that's a great way to end it, Paul, and probably a a good segue into a future episode or maybe the next one on uh, opportunities and, and why we do this in the first place and, um, and, and everything that is done for us. So um, I think that's good. Maybe we'll leave it at that and uh, catch you guys next week. So as always, um, leave us a review, uh, whatever you're listening on, leave us a, a five-star review rating um, and reach out to us uh, through the email in the show notes if you want to learn more. Yep. Have a great day, everybody. All right. See you, Paul. Hey, thanks for listening, everybody. If you'd like to have a conversation with us to see how you can become your own banker, or if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to tackle on a future episode, please send us an email to David and Paul at the ibcguys.com. And subscribe and leave us a review if you're on Apple. Follow and leave us a five-star review if you're on Spotify. And please share this with your friends. We'll see you next week.